who will speak about the isoplanometric problem on integers. Okay, um, so this talk is um, about sets with high volume and low perimeter, whatever that means. It's based on a paper um, that I wrote with the same name. Um, so if you want to know more about this stuff, hey, there's a paper called that. You can read that. Um, or talk to me afterwards. I realized that the talk that I'm about to give doesn't make for a very good beginning to end. Here's the story sort of talk where you come away knowing exactly what happened because there's a little bit too much setup to get to the punchline. However, I think it would make an okay story, so that's the angle I'm going to go for. More of an experimental math, the journey of sort of story. And this is an experimental math seminar, so that's the goal. Um, so the, the problem sets with high volume and low perimeter. You say, what on earth? What do you mean volume, perimeter? Okay. Volume of a set, we're just going to hear these definitions that we floating around that give an example. Volume of an integer subset, we're just going to add up all the stuff inside, and that'll be the volume. And the perimeter, we're going to add up the stuff on the, we'll call it like a boundary, where the boundary is like the guys in the set whose successor or predecessor, they're not both in there, so it's kind of on the edge, as it were. Example. Mm -hmm. That'll be flipped around. Those concepts are the name of the game. Example. If we have, say, I don't know, some set 0, 1, 2, 3, 10, 11, 12, then the volume of that set is just you add up all the elements, so 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 10, 11, and 12, which is whatever that is, and the perimeter. How about here, right? <laughs> the perimeter. If someone else can do that. The perimeter is just the elements on this like boundary. The elements of whose successor or predecessor aren't in there. So zeros in the club because negative one's not in there. One's okay. Two's okay. But three's in there because four's not in there. Ten. Twelve. And twelve. But eleven and those other guys are kind of like in the middle. So the perimeter is just those guys, which is 0, 3, 10, and 12. I can almost do that. 25. And the volume is bigger than that. 25 plus whatever. Someone else. Okay. Is it 40? 39. We'll go with that. 39. So that's the name of the game. Volume perimeter, and the, the universe where our sets are going to come from is the non-negative integers. Um, if you throw in negative integers, kind of boring stuff will happen because you can kind of throw them in and they won't affect the volume so bad and you can kind of cheat the perimeter down, something like that. But that's not the name of the game. Hey, what's the name of the game? I'm going to define among all sets that have, uh, alright, so it's going to be a minimum sets that come from our universe, which is the non-negative integers, we want to minimize the perimeter given the volume, given that the volume is at this, and this defines like a sequence, you could call it PN, but that's the object to study is this sequence. You say, hey man, given that the volume is like 4, What's the smallest you can make the perimeter? And you think, ah, gee, if the volume is 4, how small could the perimeter really be? I don't know. It could be, say, let's, let's work that one out. We could use the set, just the singleton 4. So, okay, so this minimum, for instance, it's smaller than 4, because we could just throw 4 in there. Uh, but we've got to, like, take the minimum for all such sets. Uh, we could do another one that's, like, 0 and 4. And we could do like a, maybe a 0, 1, 3. And you can take out the 0. That's about it. But all these guys, what do you know? Perimeter is 4 for all these guys. So the minimum of such perimeters, hey, it's 4. And then the name of the game, how do we find P of n? This question with these notions of volume and perimeter, these were posed by some guys, got them. Uh, da -da -da -da. I've got to keep myself honest. Uh, Miller, Morgan, Newkirk, 
Peterson, Seferis, and they did this in a month or uh, an article in Mathematics Magazine. They said, hey man, what's up with this sequence? They got some asymptotics for it. They said that P of n is asymptotically um, the square root of 2n. And it's about all they got. So it was kind of open. It's like, what do, what do we do now? But they had at least some asymptotics on it, which make them feel kind of good. But let's go algorithmically. How could we compute PN? That's going to be the name of the game. Something akin to, I don't know what Dr. Z might call the caveman algorithm for this problem, would be to just list all the subsets of volume 100 or whatever, look at the perimeters for them all, and then just see what you get. Um, and a stupid way to do that would be to list all the subsets that at least kind of make sense, check their volume, check their perimeters, see what you get. Um, I'll call that maybe the brute force approach. Can you see that? It looks a little grayish. Yes, Tom? Um, yes, can you read this one? Okay, cool. Um, the brute force, which would take ish some sort of exponential time if you don't do anything clever. If you only look at like the, uh, the sets that add up to the thing you want, you could shave it down a bit, but not really, not so much. It's pretty inaccessible, lofty. So you do like the back of the envelope um, ideas, and you say, well, if the algorithm takes like two to the end to, to run, ish, how far could I really expect to push it? And my line in the sand that I always do um, is if the algorithm would take more steps than there are subatomic particles estimated in the universe, that's over the threshold of simply impossible, and that's the never sort of range. So this algorithm will simply never get above like 200-ish. Um, uh, that's conservative, you could even say lower. But straight up, you can't figure out P of 300 using this algorithm. That's just much too big. Uh, so you got to do something else, which is where the experimenting comes. What are you going to do? Um, thoughts. Could you try like add numbers up until they're just about to get to the volume, mm -hmm. and then like play around with? Trying to modify that string as little as possible. Yes, that's idea three, yeah. which I will talk about. Um, I'll list this idea too. Um, the idea: try to make a string a consecutive string because consecutive is kind of nice. If you made it like zero to fifty, the perimeter of that guy's only fifty, but his volume is pretty good. So the idea: eh, try to make it something like that. And then fudge it a little bit until it's the volume is what it should be. That's uh, that's an idea. We'll call that maybe overshoot volume. And then I don't know. Fudge it. Try to make it better. Or fiddle might be a better a better word for that. Then fiddle with it, see what you can get. But it's not clear that that sort of algorithm would even get you the optimal thing. Look at the shape of the ones that work. Okay. In other words, do the brute force and then start looking at the shape of the ones that work. Okay. To give you the minimum. Brute force gets you up to like 40. No, no, no. No apparent shape. Okay. No. No apparent shape? Not so much. No, wait, you no, guess no. a shape and then you say, dang it, I thought this was going to work, but it didn't. You try like some sort of greedy algorithm and then you say, ooh, it doesn't work. The greedy algorithm that's like this sort of a thing, right. it fails for like n equals 8. And you say, ooh, I don't know why it fails. So it's not clear that it's, you know, going to work itself out or something. How about if uh, the problem were a little bit different? If you had to compute instead of whatever this poop is, you had to compute just uh, how many sets there are whose volume is n. So that's just computing a partition thing with distinct parts. Um, what's an algorithm to do that other than, say, the magic generating function stuff? You could list all the sets that work and then check up the Oh, crap, that's too long. some sort of auxiliary function, as it were. Let's not look at all the sets in the world. 
Let's just look at some. Let's just look at, say, uh, defining a new function. And it's going to take some other thing. It's not going to be all the sets. It'll just be the ones that live 0, 1, up to k. But then we want it to do the same thing, minimize the volume or perimeter given the volume of some fixed thing. This is the same sort of thing that you can do with like the partition function, which is uh, nice. Why? Because, uh, for instance, this little p of n k, clearly if you let k get bigger and bigger, what you're doing is you're, you're allowing a to live in a bigger and bigger range. And if you let k to be big enough, it doesn't matter anyway. Um, you get something like the thing we really care about equals this other thing that Pat says is apparently important. If you let k equal, say, n. And if you don't believe me, let k equal like a thousand times n, and then you'll believe me. But either way, OK, cool. So instead of computing this big old p, which we don't have a good algorithm for yet, we could instead try to compute, say, baby p. Which, why did we do this? Is this classic sort of uh, dynamic programming kind of trick? You can try to get a recurrence from here. Turns out you can. You think about it a little bit. You say, well, if the thing has to live in 0 to k, then you got a couple options. Option 1, it didn't even reach all the way up to k. We found a good set that was 0 to k minus 1. Option 2, oh, we did find one that's k, but it didn't feel like using k minus 1. So then it's kind of like that one plus whatever's left. Option three, something a little bit more nuanced, where it uses k, then k minus one, blah, blah, blah. Point is, you can get a recurrence for this, a recurrence for this little piece. Uh, you can get one just kind of by partitioning these sets of interest into like their maximum element sort of a thing. Um, but we can get a recurrence for this baby p of nk, which is great. And using that, it takes nk time and nk memory. And I'm going to square it in there. Yeah. So we moved it, and if you let k equal say n, then that's the thing we wanted. Turns out it worked. This is the part where I skip the thing that I said I would skip. It's too much. This is the part. Trust me, it's good for it. You think about it, you'll get it yourself. Don't think about it now. Auxiliary function. Auxiliary function takes us down to end of the two and a half. Not bad. Um, but time and what's the memory? N squared ish. You can't really get rid of. You can't cleverly forget stuff like you can with a lot of this sort of dynamic programming things. What you do is you make a table of previously calculated stuff. And then you kind of just push it and hope that you can forget things so that way the table doesn't get too big. Turns out you can't forget stuff because the things you need are kind of all over the place. I believe you need each thing infinitely often, but I haven't cared to prove that. i just pretty stinking sure it's true. And if it's true, why would you prove it anyway? Because it's not very relevant. Anyhow, so we got this. Not bad. Using this, we can compute stuff. And uh, Maple can get uh, using this, algorithm, this auxiliary function sort of algorithm where we just try to compute this p of little guy. Uh, maple can get us up to say n equals 300 without too much trouble. Then when it gets up to 300 it slows down and I scratch my head and I say why did that happen? Because I mean really 300 squared is less than a thousand squared which is like you know, a million and really I'm asking it to do a million things and it's pooping out. I kind of scratch my head, and I decide Maple's just kind of weird about how it uses memory, which is true. Maple does some slow things that you can't account for. So you try something else, and I, I'm a one-trick pony. So I try, say, C++, and then you're able to push this up to n equals, like, 30,000, which is pretty good. And you're like, that's yeah, great. I got a lot higher up for free. All I did was use the language, and some of you guys are way better at computers than I am, and you say, Oh, I'm your friend, but you're an idiot. Why did you use C++? You should have done something else. And I'm sure you could use the same algorithm naively getting up to higher than whatever. Problem being, um, when, you need to, when you need to store this stuff, the memory, memory when you get up to like 
30,000 is pretty much if we were up to like 33,000 and we have to like square it. So I'm bad. Someone help me out. I'm going to get a 9. What, what's 30,000 squared? Poll in the audience. 9 and 8 zeros. Agreed. <laughs> is, that, is that 90 million? No, 900. 900 million? So we need to store 900 million numbers. The numbers are pretty small. They're all like four digits or smaller. But 900 million is a lot. And, you know, you think about it and you say, oh, wait a second. Even if I'm using, say, I don't know, I suck at this game again. But that's a lot. That's like 900 megabytes plus. Multiply it by some constant for how many things in the thing. And you're like, oh crap, I really am being unreasonable with my memory here. That's why it poops out there. And that's, that's understandable, and that's one of those things where the computer stops and then you say, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. I didn't mean to ask you to do that. But it poops out. And then seg faults and bad stuff happen. You say, crap, man, I want to push this higher. Why do you want to push it higher? One, that's the name of the game. I'm trying to experiment. Two, because he's also thought of another thing on the way. We'll get to back to how do we push this higher in a second after you realize we need to push it higher. Let's switch gears. And then we're going to get into this third idea in just a sec. I'm going to erase this for the sake of erasing something important. But I'm doing it. Let's stop trying to compute it. Because computing is for sissies. Computing is obviously the, the weak way out where you compute because you're trying to figure out what the sequence actually is and hopefully the computing will help. But really, the obviously, the end game would be, wouldn't it be great if I say, here's the sequence, bam! Or a nice cute little recurrence or something would obviously be better. So let's just try to switch gears to that. By the way, you're running your simulation thing. You don't see much. You're seeing some patterns. You're not quite sure yet. Especially because you thought of this part before you got up to 30,000. You think, huh. How about, uh, how about lower, some, let's get some bounds on uh, P of N. Okay, uh, here's one for you. And some of you already talked about this. This was in that paper that I alluded to where they originally posed this question and they got their asymptotics. Their one thing was because they had this lower bound. That no matter what, your p of n thing is going to be bigger than or equal to root 2n minus a half. Why? Probably the best you can do is to take like the first uh, consecutive integers or whatever. Uh -huh. And that's probably where the... Yeah. 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 Let's say, um, so brush it, that same thing, you could maybe streamline that thought. The maximum element of our set, whatever our set is, its maximum element needs to contribute to the perimeter because the element that's bigger than it isn't in the set because it's maximum. So uh, the perimeter, you could say in general, perimeter of A is bigger than or equal to the max element of A, which is bigger than or equal to square root of 2 times the volume of A, something like this. You can quadratic formula could do something a little bit different, but this looks nicer. And it's still true. So something like that. The perimeter is bigger than the maximum element, which is for sure true. And the maximum element is bigger than or equal to this stuff, because if you went zero to maximum element, you would get whatever, and that's that. So that's, whoa, we got a lower bound. Cool. But then getting an upper bound, for instance, is harder. What these guys did, who got this upper bound, when they got this asymptotic, they got this lower bound using that little, you know, one line thought. We go, oh yeah, of course. Um, and they got another bound where they're saying, hmm, how do we show that uh, the perimeters, the smallest possible perimeter, isn't too big? They said, hmm, look at a set like this one. They pulled one out of the sky, kind of using a greedy algorithm. And they said, if using a greedy algorithm to construct a set, you can construct a set whose volume is what it should be, and the perimeter is not too bad and they did some greedy sort of construction to get an upper bound on this guy, and their bounds were close enough to get the asymptotics, and they were excited. Their wiggle was something like n to the 1 4th times some logs or whatever. Which, by the way, happens to be the truth, that there is a gap there. Anyways, 
But how would we, how would we uh, nail down from this sort of thing an idea? Well, I probably shouldn't erase that. But let's consider this. If I take uh, the perimeter of, say, whatever that number is, 0, 1, and 2, that's the you know, uh, second triangular number. I take perimeter of 3 with the smallest possible perimeter. The volume has to be 3. Well, from, say, the suggestive notation of nothing else, you realize, wait, this could be achieved by a set whose elements are 0, 1, and 2. And that would be, say, you could get 2. Uh, so I get that way. 2 is possible. And then you look at that and say, oh, wait a sec, that means that 2 is the truth. Uh, similarly, if you have a triangular number, a number, you know, 0, 1, 2, blah, 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 up to n, or whatever, hey, yeah, you get some nice little formula. Uh, 0, 1, up to, I don't know, um, big m. The smallest you could possibly do, if you did volume you're trying to hit, is of this very special form. The best you could do is you use a set that's of that very special form, and then you hit it. And you think about it for a little bit and you say, well, no matter how I slice it, if I'm trying to get a volume that's this big, I need to use an, the maximum element needs to be at least m anyway. So I have to pay the max element and maybe other stuff. And the max element has to be at least this big. So, oh yeah, okay, so it's definitely, this is definitely the best way to do it. And it's the unique best way to do it, you can think. So, oh, cool. So if the number's a triangular number, we're, we're golden, we did it. What if it's not a triangular number, which leads us into this sort of try to make it look kind of nice, and then maybe it's not quite, maybe we can do something. What if the number doesn't look like a triangle number, but it instead looks this one? It instead looks like a triangular number minus one, like, you know, one or, well, not one, <laughs> zero, or, uh, well, I don't know about zero. Either way, say uh, five. You have, I'll, I'll take this, you have 2 plus 3, or uh, you have 2 plus 3 plus 4, or like, you know, 2, 3, 4, and 5, or just 2. <coughs> and you're looking at these and you say, well, to get a, a set like this, we already know that it has to be bigger than... Uh, Five. Five is a lower bound for like this guy because the maximum element needs to be at least five. You're good for it. Four is a lower bound for this guy. We got that from that thing I erased perhaps foolishly. Three is a lower bound for this guy. Two is a lower bound for this guy. So we already have lower bounds, for instance. And if we can get the upper bounds close enough, we can probably say, yeah, it's, it's got to be it. And we don't have to, you know, compute them, which is nice if we wanted to do, say, two up to a million or whatever. But again, these numbers look special. But you could realize a a volume of 2 plus 3 plus 4 with a set, 2, 3, 4, and it's almost good. You could realize it with something that says perimeter, say, 4 plus 2, namely the set 2, 3, 4. And this one you could realize it with a perimeter of 2 plus 5, yeah. well, namely 2, 3, 4, 5. And you could try to do something else. But you think about it. And you say, well, if I were to do something else, I guess the maximum element would have to be bigger, because you can't really fiddle around with anything. If I say, hey, man, find a, a set whose volume is whatever that is, uh, 15 minus 1, 14. Set volume 14, maximum element 5. You think about it for not too long, you realize it's just this guy, and you can throw in 0 if you feel like it. Say, okay, cool. So then maximum element six. Ooh, now we're making this number bigger. So I don't know if we can really bring down this. I don't really know. Um, turns out, no. It's the best you can do, except in this case where it's two. But all the other ones equal the thing plus two. And you get that by thinking about it and hoping that maybe stuff goes wrong at the beginning, where this isn't two plus two. It's just two, but that's because it's kind of special. It's small. It's kind of, you know, there's no consecutive string anyway. So what did we expect? Plus there's only one set of volume two other than the, the other stupid one. This guy, five. Okay, this guy, six. This guy, seven. The next guy, eight. The next guy, nine. So you go, okay, that's a nice pattern, except for the first guy, 
Everything did work out in the end. Triangular numbers, they work out right away. You, get, you go 0 up to m, it's just m. But if you say throw away 1, it doesn't work right away. But then this nice pattern starts arising. And what's the nice pattern? It's, well, you do kind of the same thing, and the thing you throw away at the beginning might change a little bit, or you might have to figure it out. But eventually, the things that you throw away to get the optimal set, it's pretty much just make a consecutive string and then throw away something. It was, you threw in too much. We threw in something that got us all the way up to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But then you know, eh, throw away the 1, then we're bad, the volume's back down where it should be. And the perimeter's not messed up too bad. And it works out, which you can't convince yourself of in this case. But then that emboldens you. That makes you say, wait a second. Is this a pattern? What pattern? I didn't really specify the pattern. It's so great. But let me give you some like uh, notation. Then we'll be on the same page. I'm erasing this and I'm cramming the notation tiny, but it's going to work out. Let's write a number n in the following form. I'm going to write it as a triangular number, the one that's just bigger than it, minus a little bit because we overshot it. So we're going to write it as zero plus one plus two plus f of n, whatever that is, we're going to kind of make f as small as possible, minus this like little overshoot. And the things that I said were, uh, this is like triangular number minus a little bit, it's like a defect of how close it was. The g part is like, oh, it was close. The f is, oh, you know what it gets. Um, fun fact, that thing equals f if you throw in some floors and such. So f is really not an exotic thing. And 